Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about how prokaryotes, so these are organisms that are often microscopic and ha do not possess a nucleus, how they're beneficial to the biosphere. In other words, how they contribute to all of the life on the planet Earth. I know that's a that's a big topic to uh, to undertake. So this is really just you know the highlights of such a an important topic like this. But you got to figure these prokaryotes. You know they get a bad rap, and maybe rightfully so. They they do cause a lot of horrific diseases, and th those are the pathogenic disease causing bacteria. And so I, I'll I'll touch on that a little bit. But what I really want to emphasize in this particular uh, discussion is j j how important they are you know like I don't know if bacteria were to disappear there would be life would survive or the chances would be very dim on the earth and one of the primary examples like right from the start of this conversation is one of the most important bacteria of all prokaryotes are those that live in a symbiotic relationship with plants and in particularly uh, plants called legumes and legumes and their root system have these root nodules that contain thousands upon millions of bacteria and it's like what are they doing down there are they are they benefiting the plant in some way and the answer to that is yes and again scanning electron micrograph of a root of a legume and you can see that they they form these colonies and the particular bacteria in question is a bacteria called rhizobium, kind of a cool name. And these are infamous in biology for taking atmospheric nitrogen and fixing it. So nitrogen gas comes in from the atmosphere, goes into the soil, percolates into the soil, and what these bacteria are capable of doing is turning it into ammonia, and thus produces a type of nitrogenous compound that plants are able to, and this is the root system of a plant, are able to take in and then get a source of nitrogen which they use to survive. So if plants need bacteria in order to make the nitrogen available, and so plants that have this going for them, again, legumes, uh, also like clover can do this, alfalfa can do this, and then as you can see in this picture here, this is a beautiful picture of the Napa Valley and these plants right here that are interspersed between the, the vines, the grape vines, are mustard plants. And mustard plants are particularly good at doing this as well. And so they have the bacteria in their root and so they're able to take nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and basically turn it into ammonia for which then the grapes are going to be able to benefit. And again, this benefits the whole um, food chain because plants are then going to produce and then primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. And so rhizobium bacteria, nitrogen fixing, uh, very crucial. And then again, transmission electron micrograph of the very nodules, root nodules, and you can see the colonies of rhizobium bacteria here where the arrow is pointing, uh, growing inside these legumes. Although a shout out needs to occur for just your good old soil bacterium that can turn uh, ammonium, which is a, the ionic v version of ammonia, um, ammonium ion into nitrate. The nitrate ion is even better received by uh, the, the roots of plants. And so these so-called nitrifying prokaryotes can convert, uh, again, uh, nitrogen into uh, nitrite, which is very important. As you can see, bacteria are really crucial for plants, but they're also really crucial for animals. And a, and a good example of this uh, at the start is, you know, our, our friend E. coli. And Escherichia coli, a common uh, intestinal bacteria, is, you know, again, not normally pathogenic, but yet is beneficial, meaning that in when it resides in the animal intestine, it's capable of helping digestion, breaking down food, and it also produces a lot of essential vitamins that then are absorbed by the animal, and so they're quite useful. Um, one of the most important uh, bacteria as it affects the ecosystem and the biosphere are these cyanobacteria, sometimes just commonly known as blue-green 
algae, but they're really bacteria. You can see here they're so numerous that the, the water is colored green as a result of them because they tend to sometimes float to the top and you can see them here getting lots of sunlight. Sometimes they live as individuals, you can see here again scanning electron microscope, and then sometimes they're found in filamental forms like in a filament. But they generate a tremendous amount of oxygen for the world. And so this is really, really important. They're photoautotrophs, and so they, they generate a lot of oxygen as well as sugar, uh, which um, is important for the food chain. So we even believe that plant, so a plant cell's chloroplast evolved from these cyanobacteria. So uh, kind of silly, but I, if I drew a plant cell like this, the chloroplasts are thought to have come from these cyanobacteria a long time ago in an ancient relationship known as endosymbiosis. In other words, these were taken in. They were once free living as they are now, and they became um, beneficial symbionts with plant cells and, and today's uh, chloroplasts. Uh, or thought. And again, some cool research on this if you're interested. If you were to s sequence some of the, the genes of cyanobacteria, they're also found similar to the, to the genes that are found, or DNA that are found in chloroplasts. And so here's a picture of the filamentous cyanobacteria. So they contribute a lot of positive to the world by producing a lot of oxygen, which is really important. Now, this particular type of bacteria right here, Streptomyces, Again, um, the name is kind of interesting because it, it's sort of a, a misnomer, a misnaming a little bit because it was once thought that this was fungi and so that therefore that the myces comes from that. But this particular type of gram-positive bacteria is the source of a lot of really important antibiotics that uh, pharmaceutical companies use to, uh, to help people who are infected with other pathogenic bacteria. So you gotta give it up to, uh, to this particular bacteria, again, Streptomyces, for producing antibiotics. And again, getting back to that, the soil a little bit, oftentimes we forget about this. You know, we, we look at the, the soil, we, or a garden, and plants are growing, tomatoes, and we don't think much of this, but boy, oh boy, down in the soil, I emphasize this nitrogen-fixing bacteria, this rhizobium right here, but in terms of just all chemical recycling, chemical recycling, prokaryotes, major role, really, really important contributors to the biosphere. How are bacteria important? Well, anything organic, any kind of decomposing organism, th something that dies or, or, or a compost pile, you've got these ammonifying bacteria that will break down the amine groups of protein or, or uh, nitrogen bases of, of nucleotides and convert the food stuff into ammonia. And then again, the nitrifying bacteria I mentioned earlier will then take that ammonium ion and convert it into either nitrate or nitrite, and then that is either taken up by the roots. And then you got denitrifying bacteria that will return uh, the nitrogen back into the atmosphere, completing the nitrogen cycle. So very important contributors to the nitrogen cycle because these bacteria, these so-called chemoheterotrophs, are our decomposers, breaking down dead organisms. So important. It's basically the link between when something dies and the new life that comes as a result of it because the death really opens the door for, for the opportunity of new life. And prokaryotes are the link between the dead and the, and the new life. <laughs> okay. I can't think of anything more important than that. So in the lab, you know, you could show, well, you know, just how significant are bacteria in the soil and, how, and, and do they help plants out? And if you're following this, you're like, well, bacteria seem to be very important, uh, helping plants take nitrogen up into their roots. But there's other elements as well that are really important. You get, you get potassium in here, you get some calcium in here, it can go on and on, magnesium. So are, is, are bacteria useful, here's the question, are bacteria useful for plants to obtain other minerals in the soil? So how do you go about testing that? Well, one thing you can do is radiate the soil with pretty strong UV uh, as a control and, and basically kill as much or of all bacteria in the soil. Okay, so that's your control. And then you, you'll have to measure how good 
is the plant taking in, like for example, potassium. If there's no bacteria, so again, you strong UV rays into the soil, killing the bacteria the, as the control, and then you're measuring ca uh, potassium uptake versus maybe some other plants. These are pine saplings of pine trees or seedlings of pine trees. How well can these plants do when there when there are bacteria in the soil? So interesting experiment, as one might predict. The 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 uptake of potassium by plants in soil containing no bacteria is modest as compared to uh, soil containing particular strains of bacteria. You can see st st strain three is like dominating. Look at this, it's like a, re a big difference. And so plants benefit from bacteria in the soil. This is what this is saying. Again, maybe obvious, but it's, but it's good to experiment on it. Well, these particular interactions that I've been referring to, like in, in the root nodules, of, uh, of legumes and the rhizobium bacteria, that's an, a great example of a symbiotic relationship, a relationship in which two different species, like for example bacteria and plants, are in living in close contact, i.e. on the root, and the larger the host, like for example the plant, has this smaller symbiont, the bacteria, and uh, there's a relationship going on. And it's like, well, relationships between organisms can not always be positive. Sometimes there's varying relationships if you're familiar with symbiosis. And so let me go through that, uh, those examples. Like when they're both symbiont, bacteria, and organism plant are benefiting, i.e. The, the organism is producing sugar through photosynthesis and therefore sustaining the bacteria and the bacteria are producing the nitrogen good for the roots of the plant it's considered to be mutualistic in other words positive benefiting on both sides of this commensalism if you're familiar with this is when one organism is benefiting and the other one's neither harmed nor helped it's sort of like a null in terms of this relationship and a parasitism or a parasite harms the host but uh, but doesn't kill it. Okay, so one is benefiting and the other one is harmed. So the parasite benefits and the host is harmed. And then, uh, you know, you'd call that a pathogen if it's causing it a, a particular disease. And so just to get these terms squared away. Great or, uh, example of mutualistic benefit is uh, bioluminescent bacteria that can live in some of the deep water organisms of, in our ocean. In other words, these fish or jellyfish can produce, or even even squid can produce, have bacteria living with them that are bioluminescent, that, that are producing light. And so the light is useful when you're living in a really dark environment. It could help you the, the, the fish find uh, prey, but it also could uh, bring prey to the fish since it's kind of a glowing light. And so it could either be defensive mechanisms or a feeding strategy, all sorts of things. Or can come of that kind of relationship between bacteria and other organisms. And again, these things are not just in fish. They, they're, these bacteria can be found in the, in the deepest part of our ocean in these, um, these hydrothermal vents that are really pulling out really hot wa water in this particular area. And there's these chemoautotrophs that are capable of uh, generating energy uh, from, from this area and therefore feed the whole trophic system down here and there's these tube worms and crabs and all kinds of organisms can thrive as a result of bacteria living in the in the uh, deep ocean uh, waters and so you know these again I mentioned at the start of the vi video that I was going to try to emphasize bene beneficial things to humans and to the rest of the world but and also some har harmful ones are going to come so uh, some bacteria, prokaryotes, uh, can, can, can be pathogenic, in other words, disease-causing, and some can be positive. And so I just wanted to point that out. So our intestines uh, have thousands of, of bacteria, different species of bacteria, not just thousands of bacteria, millions. Uh, but And a lot of these things are good. Like you can imagine, you know, they're, they're there for, for a reason. And they're uh, they're thriving, and, it, and evolutionarily speaking, 
uh, it's better for the bacteria to not harm the host. And so you're, it's better to be mutualistic. And, and so that, that's an interesting t tendency. So again, I mentioned this, they help break down food and they also help to produce vitamins, which are really important. Now, uh, a particularly di harmful disease is something, maybe you've heard of it, called Lyme disease. And it's caused by bacteria, and, but it's carried by ticks as a, as a vector. And so they cause a lot of diseases. About half of our all human diseases are caused by these pathogenic bacteria. So I can't really say you know, that they're, they're always helpful. So here's a picture of a tick. And if it bites you and it contains this, this spiral-shaped bacteria, this will then go into your body. And sometimes it manifests. It can be fatal. But it can manifest in sort of a red spot. Now, this is really dramatic. It looks like a target. And that, that would be easily detected by a physician, but sometimes it's more subtle than that. So you have to be careful about that when you're hiking in an area where there's ticks that, that could be carrying uh, a bacteria that causes Lyme disease. So it's kind of dangerous. Now, what I want to say about bacteria now in terms of their benefit is that they help our research. You may know that many of the classic uh, experiments done in, in uh, molecular biology or, or microbiology have been done with bacteria. They've basically shown us how DNA replication takes place and how they, we've used bacteria to help determine the genetic code. We, we use them even today in biotechnology and they, they help us to clone genes by, by their rapid reproduction. And, and in my lab in particular we use E. coli to uh, to clone and sequence uh, redwood DNA. And so it helps us to sequence uh, genes by amplifying um, eukaryotic sequences. Uh, you could use bacteria for a number of things. You could talk about their importance in food. You can talk about their importance in, uh, in, in many respects. Uh, just to highlight a few of them to conclude the video is that we have now engineered bacteria that can actually make plastic and we have we use bacteria as a source of bioremediation in other words we could put bacteria into the soil and help them remove pollutants from the environment we can ha engineer bacteria to produce vitamins and produce antibiotics produce human hormones produce other pharmaceuticals like insulin we could engineer them to produce ethanol uh, which can then be used as a source of biofuel and so Bacteria, small, useful, <laughs> very useful organisms. And I can't imagine life on the earth without them. They were the beginning of life, and I think they're going to be uh, present for a long, long time to come in the future. And so I hope you enjoy just a brief look of how prokaryotes are very important in the biosphere. Thanks for watching.